out 10 and 15 miles without fail pick up an intruder. And it was a funny one because I came up with a synthetic boulder that had a self-powering system in it where we had special cameras hooked to telescopes where we literally could monitor a jackrabbit at 10 kilometers in a moonless night and reliably catch him in the camera and they actually take a picture up, monitor him. And that was tied in with even some suggestions of how to have harmless roving guards out there on horseback. But they would actually work for another department of the government. And this was, these suggestions were taken very seriously. And when it comes to the point of creating artificial boulders and taking a suggestion like that very seriously, with a lot of very complex electronics putting these boulders, and the boulders, of course, placed on strategic cliffs up on the hills looking outwards away from the base, and then linking them by underground fiber or by uh, microwave, hidden microwave transmitters, back to a war room at the base, you do not spend that type of money on that type of technology unless you're planning a long-term program there. This, the military does not waste money like that, in spite of the $65,000 toilet seats. Did, did you get indications then that this and other facilities had uh, UFO-related hardware or projects? The indication was that what was in these underground facilities prior to my, the staff that I would have sent in from do, to do the work, they would remove it. There was indications from, you can look at scuff marks on the floor, you can look at a lot of where usage is on equipment, that there was equipment in these facilities and they had removed it from my men to go in and do the work. And EG&G has a history of a deep knowledge and control of everything in Southern Nevada. Uh, it's, it's common knowledge. They used to control and still monitor the test site itself. They also have the, own the contract airline that takes the employees every morning, brings them back every night to Papoose, to Area 51, and to Tonopah. So it's not an unusual environment we're dealing with here. We could almost call that EG&G's backyard and the history of the, of the company was from the nuclear testing phases during World War II and the initial testing afterwards. It was a science company meant to do work for the government offline, away from FOIAs, which is the, uh, one of the greatest concerns I have is that if we really want to find out what's going on out there, legitimately or illegitimately in the black project arena, we need to modify, if we can get it through Congress and the President, we need to modify the FOIA regulations to have no loopholes and to require that all government contractors, even black, are required to submit information through the FOIA system. Because right now, it is a, it's, a, it's a sieve. It's a giant back door for them to purposely ignore the requests of either Congress or the public. What do you say to people who contend, and, and I encounter this a great deal in uh, scientific and media circles, that we can't keep secrets like this, that if there is anything to these <coughs> electrogravitic craft and UFOs that uh, everyone would know about it, the secrets simply have not been able to be maintained and aren't maintained anymore. The ability of our government to keep secrets is actually has a long history of being very valid. There's a lot of programs that were successfully kept quiet for decades, if not close to half a century. And, uh, and during the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of announcements of programs that were kept very secret by our government. Um, example is the, um, the syphilis study, and I believe it was um, Alabama back in the 30s. Nobody knew what really went on until the, uh, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, when that program was released. And the fact that the Japanese had a biological warfare detachment working in Mongolia, who we agreed not to punish, even though they killed thousands, hundreds of our own soldiers that were POWs, simply so we could get our hands on the records, the results of their testing. That program wasn't released, and I, I believe the full story of that didn't come out until the 90s, early 90s. So that's a close to a 50-year period where they kept that 
larger project, secret, and uh, we're unable to continue the research at Fort Detrick and other places on a biological experimentation on our own people. So the ability of our government to keep secrets, if the people truly believe in what they're working on, is it possible. In fact, more than possible. They can generally succeed. What concerns me is when the projects go beyond black and that we have failure with people with ulterior motives that have gotten in control of these projects and or the funding for them and or the ability of what really is scary is to write their own checks, unlimited checks, with no recourse to anybody. They're not even in a budget item anymore. They literally authorize the Treasury to cut them checks. And this is where we need to have an audit, if you want to call it that, made on all these projects and a responsible committee start monitoring the flow of black money. Do you think this is just restricted to the U.S. or do you see that it's, it has international scope? Oh, I would say this is international in scope. The projects that we have are closely tied in with other allies' governments. In fact, I had been told back in the late 70s on one of the early classified projects I worked on, once I got my security clearance back, was that there is a secret agreement between us and the Brits that whatever we invent, they get. Whatever they invent, we get. And there is no limitation as to what it is. If our boomers look like whatever they look like, the, the Brits can make them duplicates. And we don't hold back on any of the technology because of that secret agreement that was cut during World War II. And we have other allies like that. And I believe that what we also see is we see a lot of cross-pollination of scientists from different countries working on projects, even in the most classified arenas, in the United States. I ran into these people repeatedly. The um, uh, group that is, is running a lot of covert projects, what do you see as the agenda? I mean, what agendas are operating? Uh, what, what have you come across by piecing together some of these experiences you had as a consultant in security? And I, believe my, I would believe, Steve, that my initial view on what the, the agendas were behind various black projects back in the 70s and early 80s, when I first became really aware of what was going on, above and beyond my own political attitudes on how the really world really turned, was one of still of a good basis. They were looking to defend the United States. They were looking to protect the free world. But if you get into the situation more and more, it becomes evident that they have agendas that are independent of the the goals of the United States and that the attitudes seem to be one of control, power and control. And it's, in a, it's I guess you could call that almost the second oldest profession in the world. Do You, uh, you mentioned this uh, dreadful incident in Nairobi with the, the man that was yes. apparently killed. Uh, do you, have you seen other ev <coughs> evidence of lethal force being used to maintain Secrecy on. Not as close as that event. But do you think it has been used? Oh, yes, absolutely. Where necessary, it's used. Probably need to incorporate my question in your answer. So it's... The ability of certain forces out there, Steve, to use force when absolutely necessary or other controlling mechanisms to ameliorate the danger of a leak, to control those or maintain secrecy or fear is always there. Uh, what happened to Bob in, Kent, in Nairobi is a situation where I felt that they decided that he was getting too close and he wasn't afraid and he was too powerful and they had to take him out and they take him out in a normal way. Not unlike the strange events with um, Representative Schiff here in New Mexico who almost never went in the sun because he was living indoors just about all his life as a representative in Congress, and yet he magically got an aggressive cancer. There are ways to, to attack that problem. I've talked to some people that were previously SEALs who went on some rather strange missions, and I've talked to some mercs. 
because we run across those types once in a while, who have been assigned or tasked with taking out people or affecting situations in such a way that they're using it as a control mechanism. And these people, because they are duty bound, will literally take orders and do whatever they're told. That good Nazi philosophy. That's right. So do you think that, the, for example, a biological problems such as cancer could be uh, induced or used uh, to intimidate or to take someone out of the picture? One of the, Steve, one of the problems you have in that arena is that it's kept very close to the vest. And when somebody on the, that's only on the periphery is looking at those control factors used to manipulate people, you get the flavor of it. I have not been close enough to actually taste it. I don't know if I want to. But what you have to look at is the psychological factors involved, that if they can do one whole pro, high profile hit on somebody in a specific way, what it does, it puts the fear of God into those that they want to continue to control so that they don't say anything out of tune. They don't probe where they shouldn't probe, like Senator Schiff was doing, Congressman Schiff was doing. Um, we've seen in the last 10 years a ramping up, though, if one does even the most cursory research.